Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and across the table from me is returnee from the United Kingdom, Matthew Stockton. I'm back. You are back. Yes. And you had a good time? Yes, it was time spent with family in two small villages in the UK. That sounds great. Yeah. And uh, we're recording on a bit of a special day today. Yes, it's uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day today. Yeah, I'm wearing my Every Child Matters shirt. And orange shirt. And my heart is orange today. Yeah. As Canadians, we challenge each other. Hey, what what are you doing for Truth and Reconciliation Day? Right. Just put some action into it, right? Exactly. And yeah. I think that's what Truth and Reconciliation is about. And what does it mean to you? To me, I read the book, 21 Things You Didn't Know About the Indian Act. Right. I, I read that this week. Okay. And it's a fantastic book, and I recommend it to everyone. It is uh, very eye-opening if you don't know about the Indian Act in Canada. It's definitely worth an episode okay. of Dark Poutine. Yeah, I am, um, you know, I do marketing, so mm -hmm. I, I don't cynically uh, do social marketing, but right. because it actually comes from the heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I think uh, if companies um, and brands show, hey, you know, because we have some attention, yeah. And if you can draw attention to it, that's a good start. And we're here doing, unfortunately, yet another show about missing Indigenous girls. Yeah. Well, one of the three girls yeah. that we're talking about. And we don't really get to her story until the th second episode. Yeah. But it was definitely on my mind when I was writing these two. Yeah. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. In Abbotsford, British Columbia, on the evening of September 24th, 1975, Catherine Mary Herbert, age 11, was abducted while on her way home from a friend's place. Her body was discovered almost two months later on the Matsqui Indian Reserve north of Abbotsford. Investigators determined that she was likely murdered on the day she disappeared. In May 1976, Teresa Hildebrand, 15, vanished without a trace from her Aldergrove, B.C. home. Police believed that she might be a runaway, but her family felt otherwise. For nearly four years, no one knew what had become of Teresa. In March of 1980, her skeletal remains were found in a shallow grave off Downs and Mount Lehman Roads in Abbotsford. Almost exactly two years after Teresa's disappearance, in early May 1978, 12-year-old Monica Jack was riding her bicycle near Merritt, B.C. when she disappeared. 
As Monica was of indigenous heritage, her disappearance later fell under Project EPANA, the RCMP's initiative to solve the multitude of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls along BC's infamous Highway of Tears. In June of 1995, Monica's remains were discovered off a logging road on Swakam Mountain to the west of Nicola Lake and several kilometers from where she was last seen. Families of the victims had their suspicions about suspects and worked hard to hold police on task to solve the murders of their girls. The search for answers would go on for decades in two of the cases, and the third is still unsolved. You are listening to Dark Poutine, Episode 238, Delayed Justice, Part 1, The Murders of Catherine Mary Herbert and Teresa Hildebrandt. On September 24, 1975, Catherine Mary Herbert, her friends and family called her Kath, had been hanging out with her girlfriend, Corey Premack. She'd gone to Corey's place after school. Corey Premack's family lived on the west side of the Abbotsford Airport on Pierdenville Road. Catherine Mary's family lived a couple of kilometers away on the east side of the airport. The friends had played outside before eating dinner with Corey's family, and then after dinner went outside for more play. As it was getting dark, and it was a school night, as the sky darkened, Catherine Mary began walking the two kilometers home from the Premack place, which would have taken her across Marshall Road and then down Townline Road to her own home at 31215 King Road. At some point in her journey that night, Catherine Mary Herbert ran into another classmate, a boy from the neighborhood, named Bradley McCullough. Bradley, riding his bike, offered to double Catherine Mary a bit of the way home. Catherine Mary accepted, and the two rode as far as the intersection of Town Line and Marshall Roads. There, they stood talking under the streetlight at the intersection for a short while before Bradley rode off in the direction of his own home, and Catherine Mary began to walk the last 650 meters home, heading south down Town Line Road. Just as Bradley and Catherine Mary went their separate ways, a couple, Arthur and Eleanor Kasdorf, and their two children drove by on their way home, turning south on Town Line Road from Marshall Road. It was 9 p.m. As the Kasdorf family headed south on Town Line Road, they noticed a car parked on the west, right side of the road, a little to the south of their driveway at 1717 Town Line. Arthur thought the presence of the car was suspicious. There had recently been some thefts of gasoline from Arthur's farm vehicles, they ran a chicken farm on the property. Mr. Kasdorf drove past their driveway to pass by the car and get a closer look at it. After he did so, he did a U-turn at King Road, 180 meters to the south, then drove back north toward his property and passed by the car a second time. Arthur Kasdorf said the white car, parked in the darkness about 50 meters south from his own driveway, was either an older model Chrysler or a Pontiac. He recalled only the letters in the license plate as S, R, and D. Upon his return home, Arthur checked his farm equipment, found nothing amiss, and then promptly forgot about the incident, thinking it unimportant. Eleanor Kasdorf later described the vehicle to police as an older model white car. She said she, quote, immediately concentrated on the license plate number, repeating it over and over so she could remember it. She said that she saw one person in the driver's seat. The person, a male, seemed to be bent over away from the driver's window like he was looking for something in the car or worse, hiding his face for some reason. Although Eleanor could not see the man's face, she determined that he had a slim to medium build. Eleanor said that she didn't write down the license plate's letters and numbers, but several weeks later, when the police were investigating Catherine Mary Herbert's disappearance, she supplied it to them. Sergeant Norman McFarlane of the Matsqui Police Department took her statement. There are conflicting stories indicating that Mrs. Kasdorf could only recall the letters in the plate and not the entire thing. Mrs. Kasdorf later said that in the interview she had with investigators, she was sure she'd given the cops the same number she'd seen that night. Memory is a difficult thing. It really is, especially as time passes. And, you know, I have a hard time remembering why I went into the kitchen, but you could understand why 
Mrs. Kasdorf, having seen the, a license plate and and mm -hmm. and trying to making sure and saying I gave the right number, it becomes it's not just walking into the kitchen, right? Right. So that she would probably have had a real sense of responsibility. At the time, she probably felt, okay, I need to remember this license number in case anything has been stolen from our property. Yeah, they would never have imagined. That, that it, it would... had to do with a murder. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or potentially had to do with a murder. Yeah, because that stuff happens. My, my grandfather had a gas pump on, on the farm. Mm -hmm. And eventually in the seventies, it was fine. But in, by the time we hit the eighties, people were like going in and stealing his petrol. So he needed to put a lock on it. So yeah, that, that does happen. So that's, well, that probably would have been front of mind for them, right? Catherine Mary would have had to walk right past the man in the white car on the way home that night. It wasn't clear at first why Catherine Mary Herbert had disappeared. Like most kids, she'd argued with her mom from time to time and had made an otherwise relatively innocuous threat that she wanted to run away and hitchhike east. Perhaps, police thought, the youngster had made good on the threat. Less than two months after she disappeared, Catherine Mary Herbert's family got the worst news imaginable. On November 17, 1975, down a dirt road, in a wooded area on the Matsqui First Nations Reserve, some indigenous men were gathering wood for a bonfire when they discovered Catherine Mary Herbert's corpse. A local indigenous woman had died and it was tradition to have the funeral and then after the funeral to burn all the deceased possessions. Stanley McKay and two other cousins of the deceased woman, Louis Julian and Patrick Jasper, were gathering wood for the fire. They saw a piece of plywood on the ground not far from an old maple tree and not far from an old house that had burned down. The plywood was at or near some blackberry bushes which were growing at the end of the plywood and starting to grow over it. When Stanley lifted up the plywood, he saw the body of what turned out to be Catherine Mary Herbert. The men didn't touch her and went immediately to contact police. The piece of plywood under which Catherine Mary's body was found had been the side of an outhouse that had long ago collapsed and lay rotting in the brush. Catherine Mary's body was badly decomposed, unrecognizable facially. However, the corpse was wearing the same clothing, shirt and pants as Catherine Mary had been at the time of her disappearance. Her shoes and socks were missing, as was her underwear, according to her mother, per David Ridgen's documentary, Garden of Tears. Catherine Mary lay on her back, head turned to the right, her right arm was bent upward, her left arm was outstretched. Catherine Mary's shirt had rolled up slightly, exposing her belly. Her right leg was bent, and her left was straight out. Catherine Mary's coat lay under her body like a blanket. Catherine Mary was identified via dental x-rays. The report, after her autopsy, written by pathologist A.W. James, M.D., was unusually short for that of a supposedly murdered 11-year-old, although it paints a gruesome picture of a brutally violent death. Her body did not appear to show any evidence of sexual-related trauma, but the fact that her underwear was missing was suspect. Catherine Mary's death was caused, they assumed at the time, by a blunt force injury to the head. The left side of Catherine Mary's jaw was broken, and she had compound fractures of the skull. The 11-year-old's death was ruled a homicide. Catherine Mary's mother, Sherry Herbert, told David Ridgen for his documentary Garden of Tears that Catherine Mary loved horses and enjoyed singing. At the time of her death, Catherine Mary had grown taller than her mom. She was able to look down on her and called her Shorty. Catherine Mary was strong, too. Sherry had proudly shared that her daughter could bench press 80 pounds. She also said she had no doubt in her mind that she put up quite a fight with her killer, whom Sherry called a son of a bitch. More after a quick break. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts? First of all, mm -hmm. this is going to be sad. Yeah. Secondly, though, <laughs> she's 11 and she could bench press 80. I can't bench press 80 pounds. Yes, you can. I, well, I, pr I haven't tried to bench press anything yeah, for years. If you, can you bench press Steve? 
because he's a, around 75 pounds. Yeah. There okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, she was tall. She's a tall kid as well. Yeah. Bigger than her mom. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, I don't think I was bigger than my mom until I was like 13 or 14 because I was, I'm still shrimp. You're taller than your mom? Stop it. Wow. She's short, man. <laughs> she is. <laughs> It wasn't the first time Catherine Mary's family had lost a child. Catherine Mary's brother, Donald, also known as Donnie, had drowned in the summer of the year before, and he was nine oh, years old. Mike, stop it. You're killing me here. Yeah. Jesus. How much can how much can a mom take? We'll learn about the death of another one of her children after oh, all this as well. Horrible. Sherry Herbert, who later married and took the name Greer wrote about Catherine Mary on the now-defunct site familiesandfriendsofmurdervictim.com. The biography she wrote gives us good insight into Catherine Mary's short life as well as a mother's pain. Quote, She was born Catherine Mary Irene on November 1, 1963 in Vancouver, B.C. She weighed 6 pounds, 15 and a half ounces. My little baby girl, I was truly blessed. When I was a child, we watched a television movie with a group of immigrants trying to make a life for themselves in a new land. In this story was an incredibly pretty girl whose name was Catherine Mary. Of course, as a youngster, I was so taken with the name, I told my brothers and sisters, if I ever had a little girl, I would be naming her after this girl. When I became pregnant for the second time, I prayed so hard for a girl because I had a son and I wanted a daughter. God answered and allowed me to mother this glorious baby girl. I named her after Catherine Mary. Her middle name was Irene, after one of the best mothers I have ever known, my former sister-in-law's mom. So here I was with my little girl. I counted every finger and every toe, peeked into her diaper a couple of times because I was just making sure. After all, I didn't want to name a boy Catherine Mary. Butch loved his little baby sister. When he was old enough to really play, Butch delighted in playing catch and didn't mind playing dolls with her, nor did anyone else dare. They loved each other with a passion. Catherine Mary somehow became Kit, probably because Butch could not say her full name. Their mama said there were enough Cathys in the family. Mommy pretty well kept it to Kath or Catherine Mary, rarely Kit, and never Kathy. Oh dear God, she was so beautiful. Dark brown curly hair, made lighter by the sun. A smile that could melt the coldest of hearts, and personality plus. I was so grateful for a little girl. Her I could dress up. Boys didn't have the clothes back then that they do now. I bought her every beautiful dress, etc. that I could. It was fun to dress her up. I had three sons after Kath. I enjoyed every one of them as much as I did Kath and Butch. If I could have a baby a year, I would have done. But I had to settle for five. Kath grew so fast. She loved to play mommy to the boys, and I worked on making her realize that she had to be a little girl first and a mommy when she got married. I spent a lot of time with my children. We went on hikes, picnics, played ball, ran races, stood on our heads together in a row, trying to see who could stay up the longest, went to their favorite places for them to play in the water. I had fun with my kids. Kath and I usually sat on the blanket when the boys were in the water. We talked about all kinds of things. Being from a brutal background, I swore my kids could say how they felt about anything. They could ask me questions about anything, and it would be answered. These were the times when Kath and I had most of our special talks. These were the times when we talked about what she wanted to do. These were the times we talked about her wedding day, her future, her ideas, her dreams, not my plans for her. I didn't want to insinuate any of my own thoughts. It would be her life, her choices. I was so eager to share her dreams. She would have the support I never did. She would have the love I never had. She would not have to wonder if her mother would ever love her. Her heart ached after Donnie drowned. I didn't even know for some time after. The kids just never talked about him. I honestly thought that children must get over death a lot easier than adults did. Until one day, when Butch told me that Catherine Mary was crying. I went into her bedroom, and she was sobbing so much I thought my already bruised heart was going to break into tiny pieces. I held her in my arms and rocked her as she wept. Her words were like a knife in my heart. She missed Donnie, and she wanted to be with him. God, 
When I look back on that, my heartache increases. She did go to be with him. When her sobs were under control, we talked for a long time as to how she had missed him so much and how her brothers missed him as well. Some well-meaning idiot told my babies if they talked about Donnie, I would feel bad. It was then that I learned that they had talked about him whenever they were out of the house. It must have been so hard for my babies. I wanted to throttle whoever told them that kind of nonsense. It was then that my children began to heal. They knew talking to mommy would work in their favor. And they now knew it was okay to talk about their pain over losing Donnie. No more would they have to suffer in silence. They were free to express their feelings again. I marveled at Kath's ability to bounce back. Talking seemed to help her deal with the loss of her little brother. I was so happy that the veil over talking about Donnie had been lifted. Now his name would be a common word in our house. They were no longer afraid to talk about him. In the month of August, at least I think it was August, I joined a single parent club and did all kinds of neat outings for children. September came, and we all faced the anniversary of Donnie's death. On the morning of September 24th, Kath put her arms around me and said the same thing she always said. What are you doing down there, Shorty? She then told me she had a wonderful surprise for my birthday the next day and teased me that she was making me wait for the next day for her surprise. I took the kids to school and went about my own plans for a weekend of fun, end quote. Sherry had no inkling that day when she dropped Catherine Mary off at school, as she did every other day, that this, the day before her own birthday, would mark yet another terrible anniversary for her, the last day she saw her beloved daughter alive. The plan for the weekend was to attend the single parent's family event. They were off to visit a fish hatchery, and then a picnic, after which there were games scheduled. There was a meeting of the group that evening after dinner to finalize all the details for the upcoming weekend event. Catherine Mary was supposed to be home before Sherry left for her meeting and Sherry was concerned. Sherry called the pre-Mac home and spoke with Catherine Mary. She was long overdue. Sherry told Catherine Mary she was grounded and that she was to get her butt home right away. Catherine Mary insisted she would head right home. Sherry, feeling better that she knew where her daughter was, hung up the phone and headed out for her meeting. After the meeting, Sherry, who'd loaned out her car, needed a lift home. It was 9.50 p.m. when the friend's car pulled into the driveway to drop her off. Butch and a down-on-her-luck 16-year-old who Sherry had recently taken in ran out to meet Sherry as she got out of the vehicle. Catherine Mary, they said, had not come home yet. Butch knew where the Premac place was, so he hopped into the car with Sherry and they drove the route to the Premacs that Catherine Mary would have most likely traveled. There was no sign of the 11-year-old on the road. They knocked on the door of the Premac home and were told that Catherine Mary had left around 9 p.m. That would have given her plenty of time to get home. They drove back home and again there was no sign of the girl on the road. Sherry prayed she'd somehow find her daughter safe at home, but she wasn't there. Sherry began phoning around, calling everyone she could think of in the area that Catherine Mary might have visited. No one had seen her. Sherry then went to the Matsqui police station and reported her daughter missing. The family searched for Catherine Mary all night and well into the next day. She'd seemingly vanished without a trace. The next morning, the secretary from the single parents club called to wish Sherry a happy birthday and out of concern for her daughter's well-being, had forgotten about her own special day. Sherry said she thanked the woman for her thoughtfulness and told her that she was unable to talk because they were headed out to the school to talk to the principal. Perhaps someone at the school might have a clue as to what happened to Catherine Mary. But that effort proved fruitless. Forgoing their planned event, some of the members of the Single Parents Club arrived to assist in the search for the missing little girl. From the web post about Catherine Mary, as written by Sherry, her mom. Quote, Some members of the parents' club came over to help with the search. Every night and day we were out looking for her. I sent the two little boys to school and their brother was skipping to search for his sister, so I relented and kept him with me. I saw the light in his eyes dim. Dear God, please let her come home safe. The longer we searched, the more frightened I became that we might find her. We went into wooded areas. Wherever the soil looked disturbed, we dug. 
praying at the time we would not find her. One person said she was not dead. God wouldn't be that cruel. All the while while Kath was missing, I was so sick inside with the dread of unspoken words running around my mind. End quote. One friend of Sherry's who'd come to visit soon after Catherine Mary's disappearance kept saying that she couldn't believe Catherine Mary was missing. The woman repeated the sentiment so many times that it began to irritate Sherry to the point of an outburst. Sherry quipped, she later said stupidly, that Catherine Mary was not missing at all, but Sherry had locked her in the basement and would let her out after three weeks. Sherry then added that of course the girl was missing, otherwise they would not be having the conversation about it. The moment of weakness, coming after days of exhaustion, would later come back to bite Sherry. The woman repeated the comments Sherry had made to another woman, and she'd told others, who'd then told others. Days later, Sherry was notified by a police investigator that police officers were arriving the next day with a search warrant for the basement of her house. By then, Sherry had forgotten the offhand comment she'd made to her friend and asked why the police wanted to search her house. The officer lied at first, saying that they'd been made aware that Catherine Mary had left something in the basement that might offer a clue to her whereabouts. The officer left, and Sherry rushed into the basement to look for herself. She searched and searched for hours, and finding nothing, called the officer and told him to come back. The officer arrived, and Sherry explained her own search and asked the officer what they expected to find. The cop relented and told Sherry the truth. Someone had called police and told them that Sherry had murdered her own daughter and buried her in the basement. Sherry said the officer was welcome to search and that he did not need a search warrant. From Sherry's web post about Catherine Mary, quote, As we went through the house together, it didn't take him long to realize. I would have had to use a jackhammer, a pick, pick and shovel to get through the cement floor, and then I would have to mix the cement, replace what I had disturbed, and then age it awful freaking fast to be in sync with all the cement surrounding it. How obvious would that have been? He told me the name of the woman who said it, and I had never heard of her. He said another thing that ripped my already tattered soul. I would be able to smell her if she was dead and hidden here. The police came back the next day, and I said, go ahead and search. They did not have to, because I had already allowed the other officer to search in the middle of the night. End quote. By this time, police had backtracked to the people who'd given the story to one another and found the friend to whom Sherry had made the comment. Sherry was livid. She asked cops whether they had bothered to verify that she'd been at the single parents club meeting the night of her daughter's disappearance. Police admitted they had. How then, Sherry asked, could she have done anything to Catherine Mary? Here's more from Sherry's web post about Catherine Mary. All the gossip and the added grief how quick we are to believe lies and not question. How quick are we to always believe the worst rather than look at the best? How much more fun is it then to pass on unsubstantiated garbage? How cruel are we humans to our fellow man? Why are we motivated by jealousy, greed, and vindictiveness? Why is it we cannot be glad that someone else shares the load and takes some of the limelight away from us? All of these things lead to destruction. Are we not our own worst enemy when we do these things? Why can we not share and care on an adult level? How wrong are we for not looking at our own motivations behind what we are feeling when we are negative about another's actions? How is it that in a so-called caring world we allow others to destroy our dreams or add salt to our wounds? This is something we all have to work through every single day. And it was, I realized, just the beginning of a man's inhumanity to man. These people were not through with me yet. I received several phone calls. These were from some special person who added to my pain by telling me she would be found all cut up. The police did not take it seriously for a long time. Then they finally tapped my line and found out it was a radio announcer who had pretended friendship and caring for my family. He, of course, said I had called him and wouldn't hang up. Then he kept calling the phone company saying I was calling him all the time. Fortunately for me, there were those people in the house to say no one was using the phone. This same person was working on my son to get him to live with him and his girlfriend. Talk about sickos. He sure added to our distress. 
I had one police officer tell me not to call the police station anymore. He said they would call us if they heard anything. When I complained to another cop about it, he was quick to remind me I was a welfare mother. He paid my way. I didn't pay his. After this happened, I started to go out drinking and dancing. I didn't want to think about anything anymore. My baby was missing. My other baby was dead. I couldn't bear to feel anymore. I drank as much as I could to dull the senses. At least three nights a week were dedicated to drink. I didn't have it in the home because of my children. I have to tell you folks, drinking is not the answer. Either you face it or find another way. I sure as hell couldn't get drunk enough to make the pain of her missing go away. On Saturday, November 15, 1975, I prayed to God and asked him, If she has run away, which I don't believe, please let me know where she is. I promised I would not make her come home. I just wanted her to know I loved her. But if she was dead, which I was starting to believe, please give her back to me so I could bury her. I wanted to weep, but the tears would not come. My friends had called and invited my children and I to dinner on the following Monday. We were just about to sit down to dinner when the phone rang asking me to come home. My friends kept the children and I drove home with my heart ready to explode. Either they had Catherine marry or they found out where she was staying. That she was dead did not even enter my mind at that point. I had to calm myself. I took a deep breath as I pulled into my driveway and parked behind the police car. The date, November 17th, two days after I prayed my prayer, my baby girl was dead. She had been murdered. End quote. Mm, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt while you're reading all, yeah. of, all that letter from her. Right. I have a real fondness for this woman. Mm-hmm. Um, listening to that, she's like, she's so authentic, right? Right. She's shining a light into some like really dark crevices with this like glaring honesty, mm -hmm. no matter like it doesn't, she doesn't care like how she or anyone looks. It's just, it's just her, her absolute truth. And you say, uh, she said about the gossip, are we not our own worst enemy when we do these things? You, you said that stood out to you. Yeah. It's, um, she's right. Mm -hmm. right like the harm that a gossiping neighbor does yeah isn't just the person that they're judging yeah but it it it, it harms themselves because it, it it's a failure in themselves to interrogate their own minds mm. their own way of thinking their own morals yeah and it makes them cheap yeah right yeah <laughs> and that's why i try to steer away from assumption on this show because at what point does what we do become gossip? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I've, uh, we all occasionally make assumptions where you realize later you're totally wrong. Mm -hmm. So knowing that that's a fact, what you do is you don't talk about crap based on your assumptions. Right. Right. Because making an assumption that's in your head that you find is wrong later is fine. Yeah. But like just having this, like, what kind of, like, idiot, like, Oh, something popped into my head, an assumption. Now I'm going to blab it everywhere. Yeah. Right? It's just, it's the wrong way to live. Well, in social media, we see that on social media all the time. This is why you've noticed I've kind of stopped social media. <laughs> yeah. Except for well, Instagram. <laughs> and people miss you in the barnyard. Oh, do they? Yeah. Well, I should go on and say hi. But yeah. I, no, I, just, I wanted to spend a bit of time doing other things. Yeah. There was a suspect early on, according to Garden of Tears, a documentary by David Ridgen. Former police officers involved in the investigation said the man was the one and only real suspect in the murder. According to court documents, after Catherine Mary's body had been found, Sergeant McFarlane went back to interview the Kasdorfs about the car they'd seen. November 24, 1975. Interviewed Mr. and Mrs. Kasdorf once again. Mrs. Kasdorf claims that she definitely recalls the first three letters of the license of the vehicle seen by she and her husband last September 24th as being SRD, and she was positive the first number following the letters was a 9 and a double number after that, and here she stated that it was either 988 or 944, making the license number either SRD 988 or SRD 944. Gary Taylor Handlin, a man who had been recently paroled from prison, owned and operated a white 1970 Pontiac Laurentian bearing BC license number SRD 944. 
That evidence came from his parole documents and from ICBC records that established that on August 14, 1975, he'd purchased that vehicle. Handlin had a long record for violent sexual assault. It isn't clear what Eleanor Kasdorf actually saw. Eleanor isn't around to discuss that as she died in 2006. Memory is malleable and changes over time. Often what we swear to be true has been colored and changed by years and years of other information leaking in. Later, Handlin's defense attorneys would argue that, that in interviews with police, Eleanor had learned Handlin's license during those interviews, and it had become her memory. Not only did Hanlon drive a white car with the license plate that came close to Eleanor's memories at the time, he was familiar with the area as well as the Herbert's home. During his time in the penitentiary nearby, Hanlon was going to Kinghaven Treatment Center to attend recovery meetings. Kinghaven was right across the street from the house on King Road where Catherine Mary Herbert lived with her family. According to court documents, Handlin, quote, has a record for sexual violence, reaching back to 1963, when he was 15 and convicted of indecent assault of a 16-year-old girl. His record also includes a conviction for indecent assault on a 17-year-old when he was 21 in 1969. He used a knife to coerce the victim in that case. In 1971, he used a knife to abduct an 18-year-old, take her to a secluded area where he raped her. He was sentenced to five and a half years in November of 1971, end quote. He was on parole for the 1971 rape when Catherine Mary Herbert disappeared. Worse yet, Hanlon had been on the Herbert's property a few occasions prior to Catherine Mary's abduction and murder. 27-year-old Hanlon had dated Marlene Paul, 16, who'd been boarding at the Herbert's house. Neil Murray, another man who'd been in prison with Hanlon, brought him to the house and Gary struck up a relationship with Marlene in August of 1975, a month before Catherine Mary went missing. Even after Neil had moved out, Hanlon kept coming by to pick up Marlene. Marlene had last seen Hanlon when he dropped by to see her at 31215 King Road on September 22, 1975, only two days before Catherine Mary's disappearance and murder. Police interviewed Gary Handlin at the time, and he denied any knowledge of what happened to Catherine Mary Herbert. There wasn't enough to charge him, but cops strongly believed from very early in the investigation that Handlin was the one and only suspect in Catherine Mary Herbert's murder. They needed more evidence, though, and that wouldn't come for a very long time. The good old days of police work were not so good in Abbotsford at the time. Former Sergeant Norm McFarlane, now retired, the lead on the investigation into Catherine Mary Herbert's murder, told David Ridgen that serious mistakes had been made during the initial investigation. Rather than preserve Catherine Mary's clothing as evidence, it was buried along with her remains inside her casket. Worse yet, over the years, crucial parts of the file about Catherine Mary's murder had disappeared along with tagged evidence and many photos the investigators took. All of this allegedly occurred sometime in the 1990s with the amalgamation of the Matsqui police into the Abbotsford force. Another ex-Abbotsford cop, Ian McLaughlin, told Ridgen that it seemed like at that time no one in the Abbotsford police department really cared. He had worked all three of the murders we're covering here. McLaughlin claimed that the Herbert investigation and others had been, quote, botched from day one. Catherine Mary's mom, Sherry, had some strong words for those involved in the investigation into her daughter's murder. She wrote about them on the blog, theyaremissing.com. Quote, My baby girl was beaten to death. The pathologist, from now on referred to as the idiot, did a sparse autopsy. He said she was not sexually assaulted, but her underwear was missing, as were her shoes, and I believe she was wearing socks as well. But she didn't always. So I do not know if they were missing as well. Point of fact, the police never mentioned those facts. The idiot did not mention this in his report either. The idiot didn't mention a lot of things. His report was about one half of the page, the rest being rhetoric about him. His importance rang out, but it also showed that once he said her brain was liquefied and filled with maggots, I think he could not wait to close down her autopsy. I started having nightmares. I am plagued with them to this day. In every one, she is calling out to me to help her. 
I was not there. I wake in a cold sweat, shaking, almost always disoriented. I have no respite from these dreams. I think I will have them until her murder is resolved, or until I die. At the rate police are going, I will die before her case is resolved, if at the rate they go, it ever is. What I wish for the so-called police officers supposedly working on her case is a decidedly frightening experience similar to that of my baby girl, just that the end result is not the same. Their loved one will come home safe. I would never wish this on my worst enemy. Oh, right, they are my worst enemies, but still, I do not wish it on them. My baby girl will never graduate, marry, have a career, or children. My kids will never sit at my table again. I will never be able to hold them or feel their arms around me. I have been denied these rights that others take for granted. Please do not take your children lightly. Enjoy every single moment you can with them. I am so glad I did that. I went on spur-of-the-moment picnics, hikes with them. I tumbled on the lawn with them. I stood on my head with them. We laid on the grass looking at the clouds picking out the shapes they made or staring at the stars making our wishes as the shooting stars passed overhead. Your voice wavered a bit there. That's that's upsetting, isn't it? Yeah. P Mike, please tell me she lived through this uh, to see her daughter's killer be put away. Well... Well, we'll learn about that in the second episode. You're, you're going to make me upset, aren't you? Yeah, probably. Okay. Exactly eight months after Catherine Mary Herbert disappeared, another Matt Squee girl went missing. According to an article in the Abbotsford News in 2015, written by reporter Vicki Hopes, Debbie and Harold Hildebrandt remembered their 15-year-old younger sister, Teresa, as a, quote, energetic and feisty teen who loved music, animals, and her family. Much of the information about Teresa and her disappearance comes from this single article and only a few others, with very little information written over the years. All four Hildebrandt kids, John and Debbie, the eldest, Teresa, and her younger brother John, were a tight group. They loved riding their bikes around the more rural Bradner area, to the northwest of Abbotsford before moving to a home on Sun Valley Crescent closer to the city in the months before Teresa disappeared. Brought up with a strong work ethic, all the brothers and sisters had paper routes over the years to earn pocket money, some of which went to comic books. The Hildebrandt siblings spent a lot of summer days at Aldergrove Lake swimming and doing what kids do. Teresa's family told journalist Vicki Hopes that the girl enjoyed playing piano and loved music, especially contemporary artists like the Beatles, the Bee Gees, and Creedence Clearwater Revival. From Vicki Hopes' article, quote, Teresa was a gentle soul who brought home many stray animals over the years, but who could also be stubborn and spunky. I shared a room with her. We had our scraps. She would take no crap from me. Debbie laughs. End quote. Teresa was a pretty girl, too. Her golden blonde hair and easy smile got her lots of attention from the local boys. She had a steady boyfriend, though. She'd been going with him when she disappeared. Teresa Hildebrandt disappeared on Victoria Day, May 24, 1976. She'd failed to show up for a family dinner that night. It was one that she'd be unlikely to miss as her grandparents were attending, too. Teresa's parents, her dad, Harold, and mom, Sandy, were alarmed as the night wore on with no sign or word from the 15-year-old. The Hildebrands called the Matsqui police and began looking for Teresa right away. Harold, Teresa's 20-year-old brother, had run into Teresa and her steady boyfriend at an A&W restaurant in Langley that day. Teresa's boyfriend said they'd hitchhiked back to Abbotsford and Teresa had walked home. Teresa was a typical teenager. She'd had her struggles. After a fight with her dad, she'd run away to Aldergrove to see her boyfriend, but that episode had only lasted a few hours. She'd come home again, and there hadn't been an incident like it since. There had been no real family tension, nor any other reason for Teresa to choose that day to disappear. Police didn't feel there needed to be a coordinated search, though. There was no mention about Teresa's disappearance in any newspaper. This really struck me how little coverage there was about Teresa Hildebrandt. Like, I scoured all kinds of different articles and those kind of things. And, I mean, she was a little older yeah. uh, than Catherine Mary, yeah. being 16. So people are maybe more likely to say, eh, she ran away or it was of her own volition that she disappeared. Or, or it's not like, you know, in, in the mass media, people 
love a tragedy and if it's definitely a child child yeah right it, it's a really sad fact of life like what else was happening at the time mm -hmm. you know was there some major news thing that pushed everything else aside sure and that like these stories get lost right Imagine, you know, you had something happens to you personally that could have been in the news to your daughter and, and then 9-11 happens, for example. Right. That's going to be the only news, right? Yeah. Yeah. For the next four years, Harold and the Hildebrand family searched for Teresa, always holding out hope that she was out there somewhere, alive. Perhaps she'd been trafficked or was otherwise being held somewhere. Harold got a tip from someone claiming to have seen Teresa in Prince George. Harold drove the eight hours to PG only to find out that it hadn't been his daughter at all. In 1980, the Hildebrandt family's hopes for Teresa's safe return were dashed and their hearts were broken. A brief article ran in the Abbotsford News on March 12, 1980. Quote, Skeleton identified as missing girl. Skeletal remains of a human body found in this area last week have been identified as those of Teresa Hildebrandt a 15-year-old Matsqui girl reported missing in May 1976. Police are treating the case as a homicide. A local youth discovered the skeleton in a shallow grave in a bush area close to Downs Road in the Mount Lehman area, police said. Positive identification of the remains was made by matching dental x-rays. Hildebrandt lived with her family on Sun Valley Crescent. She was reported missing on May 24, 1976, and last seen in Langley. The body appeared to have been at the scene for at least two or three years, police indicated. They would not release information concerning the cause of death, end quote. It was later determined that Teresa, like Catherine Mary Herbert, had been killed by a blunt force injury to the head. Teresa's obituary was short, too. It reads, quote, Memorial service for Teresa Ann Hildebrandt of Aldergrove will be held today, Wednesday, at 2 p.m. in the Aldergrove United Church, Rev. Jim Ford officiating. Cremation will follow in Victoria Memorial Park Crematorium, Surrey, with Woodlawn Funeral Home in charge of arrangements. Born in Murrayville in 1961, Teresa had attended Bradner Elementary and Clearbrook Junior High Schools. She was reported missing in 1976. Her remains were discovered in the Mount Lehman area last week. She is survived by her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Harry Hildebrand of Aldergrove, her brothers Harold and John of Aldergrove, sister Debbie Metzner of Clearbrook, and both her paternal and maternal grandparents. Harold Hildebrand's hair went white, seemingly overnight after Teresa's body was found. He didn't share any information he'd gained about Teresa's disappearance with the rest of his children. He passed away from a massive heart attack at 49 years old, three years after Teresa's body was discovered. From Nikki Hope's article, quote, The family sprinkled his ashes in the Similkameen Valley in Princeton, in the same spot where Harry had spread Teresa's ashes, which he had carried on the back of his motorcycle on a solo trip, end quote. Teresa's disappearance and murder did not receive any of the attention that Catherine Mary Herberts or Monica Jacks had. It isn't clear why. Perhaps it was the initial police response that she'd run away. There were no TV or newspaper stories about her, but to her family, she was, of course, everything. Also, as her murder remains unsolved to this day, the police have been playing the details of her case close to the vest. So, again, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there's, there's nothing about Teresa Hildebrand. Nothing. Imagine, Mike, like if, if this is your daughter. Mm-hmm. You know, for you personally, yeah, you'd want it to be leading the news, like the front page of every newspaper across the country, right? Because this is your world. Right. Right. And it would be so hard to see that the world just goes on. It's like, well, what about us? Yeah. You know, like yeah. we are missing somebody who we love dearly. Yeah. yeah. What about us? Yeah. That's and that's what I keep thinking. What about them? Yeah. At this point, connected or not to the murders of Catherine Mary Herbert and Monica Jack, who committed Teresa Hildebrandt's murder remains a mystery. In our next episode, we'll learn of the murder of Monica Jack and subsequent decades-long investigations, leading to the arrest of suspect Gary Taylor Handlin almost 40 years after Catherine Mary Herbert's death. And that's it for Dark Poutine, episode 238, Delayed Justice, part one, the murders of Catherine Mary Herbert and Teresa Hildebrandt. 
That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Well, I guess this is take 14 of us trying to do the voicemails <laughs> because uh, we haven't done it for a while. So we were listening to voicemails we'd already heard and played on the show. And responding to them and yeah. everything. Yeah, it was really nice. I was like, hey, it's Great Big Pete again. Hey, it's yeah, Lacey ex- again. Exactly. Hey, it's that Damien guy. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, let's listen to ones that we're sure we haven't heard. Here's our first one. Hi, Mike, Matthew. Uh, this is Jeff from uh, Quebec City or Jean-François. Uh, you uh, you talked about opening up a honey shop in Quebec when uh, you did my shout out for being uh, for uh, joining um, Patreon. So yeah, I'm from uh, Quebec City, uh, originally from uh, New Brunswick. So I'm a, a proud Acadian, and I'm raising my kids in Quebec to be proud Acadians also. That brings me to a suggestion for a good subject. I think would be the Acadian expulsions in, uh, that started in 1755 in uh, mainly Nova Scotia. Uh, it's a very interesting story and definitely a part of uh, Canada's dark history. It's as much a crime as any crimes that you deal with uh, on your show. And uh, I'd really enjoy to uh, see it get the dark poutine treatment. Other than that, I had a second suggestion. Uh, have you guys ever thought about launching a dark poutine book club about uh, true crime, uh, true crime books? It would be, uh, I think it would be very interesting. Anyway, that's it for now. I'll probably be calling again because I got tons of ideas. I- I've been taking notes. I just finished uh, binging the shows and I've been taking notes, uh, different episodes. So I got all kinds of uh, additions or uh, comments on the different sh- uh, different episodes that, that you did. Uh, it's You guys are excellent. Keep up the good work. Allez chier dans vos chapeaux or shit in your hat. Say hi to Steve, of course, from uh, Regis, Raul, and Rita, my three pups that are also on the barnyard. And uh, yeah, keep up the good work. And if ever you're uh, in Quebec City, I can introduce you to a guy that, that sells uh, honey in bulk. We'll, we'll set you all up and uh, I'll go have coffee with Matthew on the on the, 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 the front porch of the, the store. All right. Have a good one, guys. And uh, keep going with the, the, the good show. Well, thank you so much. Uh, to address your first suggestion oh, absolutely i want to do that story. absolutely 100 percent. that is on the list of things that i want to do and i want to do that probably in the new year okay yeah because um coming from nova scotia i i have a little bit of history with that ideas about yeah the acadians i, I was actually in quebec two weeks ago there you go um with a proud acadian yeah yeah great I, I love the quebec the Quebecois accent, uh, that francophone uh, drawl. Yeah, it's really great. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Jeff. And we do have a book. We have the reading room, the Dark Poutine reading room we already. We did a book club. Well, Mike's working on a second book. Yeah. So he'll probably launch a book club just to like do his two books. Yeah. <laughs> we, could, we could do <laughs> so that. So we'll do the first one and then the second one, then go back to the first one again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, please. And buy it multiple times in different formats. Yeah, we have to do the the, the books bought in August book club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, if if uh, you want multiple books signed, mm-hmm. then uh, we'll have to travel to do that at some point. So maybe I'll come to Quebec with you on one of your journeys. I've never been to Quebec City City. Oh my gosh, it's great. And I really want to go. It is a great place. I have a feeling that oh, like, I'll love it. You will. want to like I, totally live there and open my honey shop. I guarantee you will love it there. Uh, let's move on to our next voicemail. This one is a bit shorter. Let's have a listen. Hi guys, this is Lynn. I'm just an ordinary schmuck from Marion, Iowa in the U.S., That's the state in the Midwest that no one knows about unless you're driving from Omaha to Chicago. I'm really enjoying the podcast, especially learning about some Canadian history like the Nova Scotia tsunami, which I'd never heard about until I listened to you guys. But two questions. Does it make me a bad person if I bust up laughing once in a while while listening to podcasts about murder and mayhem? And what's an Enimo bar? <laughs> I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. And you guys uh, go shit your hats. 
Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs> well, there you go. I've driven through Iowa. I, I drove through Iowa literally on the way to Chicago from <laughs> Omaha. Yeah. Um, Lynn, Google N A N A I M O M O Nanaimo. Nanaimo. Yeah. They are super sweet. Yeah. Actually, actually, make the recipe and then call in and tell us how it turned out. Yeah. I find them too sweet for my liking. Yeah. They, they, your teeth will fall out. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they're named after a small town here in British Columbia, mm-hmm. Nanaimo. N A N A I M O. It's a town. Well, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure? Nanaimo. Oh, the bustling city of Nanaimo. Yeah. <laughs> where they have an opera and a ballet. My uncle, my great uncle was, uh, a surgeon at Nanaimo General, okay. and um, he was he's in the newspaper a lot it, what, during his time there because he was also a bagpiper, and he would play bagpipes at people's weddings, funerals, all that kind of thing. So Wow. Yeah, Uncle Carmen, Carmen Brown with an E. Yeah, interesting cat. Anyway, uh, yeah, so Nanaimo. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 827 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Wow, it's been a while since we did the old Patreon thing. Uh, do you have your thinking cap on, Matthew? I hope there's hundreds of them. There aren't. Well, you, uh, you, there's you, two. You need hundreds, but we will take two. <laughs> yeah, it's tough times for people, but... Uh, I, so we really super appreciate the people that do. Yeah. Um, first up, we have Lisa Christensen. And Lisa. I, don't, I don't know where Lisa's from, Matthew. Lisa is <laughs> from a small village called Siddlesham. Okay. In West Sussex in England. In Oh, wow. Yeah. What what does she do in, you said Siddlesham? She works at the Rabbit and Cat Rescue. Well, that's nice. Yes. So she rescues rabbits and cats. Yep. And uh, then makes stew out of them. No, and then it's like <laughs> little, they can adopt. Oh, she, ad- she adopts, adopts them, them out. out. Yeah. Uh, that's nice. It's, I'm glad it's not for like Eating. fur coats or anything no, like that. No, that wouldn't be nice. No, it wouldn't. Uh, so thank you, Lisa. And thank you for your help with the bunnies. And exactly. The, the bunnies. Um, next we have Jennifer Hess, and she's from just a little bit beneath us here, Everett, Washington. Everett, Washington. Everett. Yeah. I wonder what she does there in Everett, Matthew. Jen Hess. Harbor master. She's a harbor master. She sure is. Um, so helps boats uh, get docked and sends out the well, tugboats and all that well, kind of she stuff. She manages the people that do that there you go because she's the master the master i i i yeah i used to want to do a job like that I harbor think that, master yeah i would have liked that oh well, you're from you're from the atlantic provinces it's yeah. in your blood yeah i guess so i don't know why i i <laughs> used to think that that would have been a cool job did i ever tell you what i wanted to do when i was a kid no my dream and, and if I ever won the lottery, I'd actually do this. What, the honey I, shop? No, this was the childhood thing. Okay. I wanted to own a laundromat when I was like seven years old. Okay. A laundromat. Yep. Do, do you have like particularly nice memories of laundromats? Is that what? When my mom's washing machine broke down, we had to go there for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And I saw people putting quarters into the machines and doing all the work themselves. And all the guy did was take the change. Yeah. And quarters was like candy money. So I'm like, this is the easiest job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I want to own a laundromat. You want to own a laundromat? <laughs> you, would you still do that? Probably not. I wouldn't manage it, but I'd own it and I'd make it cool. There used to be a nightclub in Miami. Mm-hmm. That, that I, I think you have talked about this. Oh, have I? So uh, no, I honestly, okay. Everyone out there, it's true. I have a fascin- an absolute fascination with laundromats. So what, what was this thing you were going to tell me about in Miami? A nightclub. Daytime is a laundromat. Right. Nighttime is a nightclub and you could actually do your laundry Still. and dance. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, <laughs> sounds like a good place. I love a good laundromat. There you go. Um, next we have, uh, well, let's move on to donut money donors. And uh, our friend Megan Doman, no relation to donuts. 
I guess, says, uh, enjoy some treats on me in honor of my birthday, September 17th. So it's passed, but happy belated, happy belated birthday, Megan Doman. Thank you. Yeah. Thank we you, really Megan. appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, uh, I love a good donut. I haven't had a, a donut for a while. I had a, a croissant with chocolate filling in it the other day, which was nice. But I'm trying to eat healthy and I've cut out, um, refined sugars. Cut out completely. Yeah. Do you ever have like a cheat day or anything like that? You can see the bottle of Diet Coke? Yeah. I've decided I'm only drinking Diet Coke when we were recording. Oh my God. So I was in the UK. Yeah. And Justin's mom is like the best cook in the world. Mm -hmm. And she grows her own organic vegetable and some fruits. She lives at the end of a lane with an organic uh, dairy farm. Mm -hmm. We went to pubs, right? Like little village pubs. Sure. And I'd ha and like one of the pubs, I'd, I had a partridge and cheese from the farm next door. Did you have them in a pear tree? <laughs> my my mother-in-law made that joke, actually. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Um, so I came away with about 20 good recipes from her. Mm -hmm. And how many extra kilograms of, um, of weight? <laughs> actually, I ate better there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, than I have been at home. So sure. So I'm trying to uh, carry that on. Yeah. It's a, uh, I, I love when you go someplace and you get a bunch of different ideas for food. Yeah. Yeah. It must've been nice though to see them. We'll talk about that in the after show. Yeah. The, and it's going to be fascinating. So all the listeners out there, the after show is when Mike and I just completely unleash what we really think. So become a Patreon yeah, and you, you'll get the truth. I don't know yeah, about yeah, that, but you'll, you'll get the truth. Matthew will give us the truth. <laughs> Anyway, that is it. And thank you to everybody who was a donor of some description. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Uh, okay, and that is it for this week's show, and we'll be back with part two of this two-part series next time. So until then, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Yeah, be good. Don't kill anyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>